hope you enjoy your lunch. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, let's get started. So this is me. I'm the lead solutions architect at Gremlin. A little bit about Gremlin. Gremlin provides you a platform uh, to safely, securely, and easily practice chaos engineering to break things on purpose. Gremlin wants you to turn failure into resilience. While at Gremlin, I ran a number of game days with various companies. So it's fair to say that I've seen some things. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about chaos engineering and game day, so don't worry if you haven't heard these terms yet. Just want to start off with a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of chaos engineering? Good number of you, great. Uh, and of those that have heard of chaos engineering, how many of you are actually practicing chaos engineering? Not very many hands. I hope we change this next year. Now, a completely unrelated question. Uh, how many of you play video games or, or consider yourself a gamer? Good number of you. Good, cool. So I consider myself a gamer as well. Uh, I used to play a lot of games. Uh, I used to eat, sleep, and game. Well, actually, just eat and game. Uh, but uh, there was an event, and I decided to stop gaming uh, after an event. And what, what happened during the event is that the private server that I was playing on had to roll back a week. And for those of you that game a lot, one week you can make a lot of progress. And as much as I understand everything fail, it was still a pretty terrible user experience. And so it made me care a lot more about resilience. Um, but anyhow, since that event, I consciously stopped playing games. But even though I stopped playing games, uh, I still have a love of gaming. So in this talk, you'll see that I actually use a bunch of gaming reference and gaming screenshots. When I used to play games, I dream of being the best of the best, right? You know, where you have two team captains, you want to be the first pick, right? just because you're that good. Um, and I imagine having all the best equipment, perfect aim, uh, just dominate every single game. Well, the internet brings you back to reality pretty quickly. Uh, I realized I was, I was okay. I was mediocre. I, I, I would do okay. I win some games and I lose some games. Um, now, similarly with IT operations, with DevOps, with tech operations, you also imagine a world, a perfect world in some ways. Right? You, you, you think about systems never going down. Uh, there's no need to patch anything, uh, nothing needs fixing, uh, nothing ever fails. Of course, you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and always get a good night's sleep. Wouldn't that be ideal? We all want that, but we all know what reality really looks like. Reality is that you're constantly fighting fire. <coughs> Systems can fail, and they do fail. They will fail. So reality is that you're just firefighting all the time. And you're getting interrupted. You're getting paged. There's alerts going on. Uh, you have to deal with support. Just a ton of reactive work. Now, with all those reactive work, with all the firefighting going on, when the service you care about, when your own service fails, sometimes you want to give it that shrugged ASCII emoji, right? You know the one I'm talking about? Um, you want to blame it on some dependency. It's AWS fault. It's GCP's fault. Some other service that's failing you. Wouldn't it be nice to just put the blame on the others? But I encourage to you to really fight that urge. Don't say that because they fail, you have to fail as well. We all know that things fail all the time, right? Servers can fail. Power outage happens all the time. Uh, networks can fail. You can be choked. Uh, other dependencies will fail. So you can do better, though. 
right? Set yourself a high bar. You ultimately own that consumer and user experience. So hold yourself to a high bar. Challenge yourself. Don't just blame that dependency that you depend on, right? They fail. You may have a way to handle it. So you don't have to fail alongside it. Now, how do you raise that bar? Chaos engineering. What's chaos engineering? It's a buzzword. It's clickbait to some extent, right? You probably came to this talk because the title says chaos engineering. Now, so chaos engineering has a fair share of misconceptions. So um, I do want to take this opportunity to, uh, to share our definition of chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is a, a practice where you are thoughtfully, practicing thoughtful plan experiments that are designed to reveal weaknesses in your systems. So we're going to look at how to use chaos engineering practice uh, to surface some of the failure condition and proactively uh, prepare for these failure situations. In short, fewer words, you're engineering chaos on your own terms. This is not when those, uh, those downtimes catches you by surprise in production, right? <coughs> this is when you proactively, when you're ready for it, uh, do it in, in, a, in a safe environment so that you're learning in a very, very controlled environment. An analogy we often use uh, is that chaos engineering is like vaccine. vaccine. You want to inject a small control amount of harm so that you're building resilience. And then uh, over time, you build immunity. Game day. One really good time to practice game day is, uh, pra practice chaos engineering is during game days. So I could define game day as a dedicated time for teams to collaboratively uh, come together and uh, focus on using chaos engineering practices to reveal weaknesses in your systems. Now, some may call it Chaos Day, Failure Friday, there's many names for it, or you can call it Chaos Hackathon, if you will. I'm gonna call it pretty descriptively for what it is, right? It's really a day that you run some chaos experiments. Let's run some chaos experiments together day. Sweet. Game days, chaos engineering, sounds good. Let's do it. Well, hold your horse a little bit. Let's first understand why we're doing this. Let's take a look at this image. See Mario? For those of you who are not familiar, Mario is the little guy here. Um, let me ask you, what's Mario's objective? You look at Bowser over there, right? So Mario's, is, um, is Mario's objective to defeat Bowser? Bowser is that really big, scary monster on the side if you're not familiar with, uh, with Mario. Um, Mario definitely needs to defeat Bowser, right? But that's only because Bowser is in, is in his way. Bowser is actually an obstacle here, but not his objective. If you look again at the image, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see Princess Peach in a cage. <laughs> Saving Princess Peach is actually Mario's objective. Now, if Mario can just go and take Princess Peach and walk back safely, why bother with, with, with Bowser? But of course, that's, that's not possible. Bowser's in his way. So uh, ultimately, he must defeat Bowser to save Princess Peach. Now similarly, a lot of people mistaken that an objective in chaos engineering is to wreak havoc, right? Break things. We even say to break things on purpose. Now, yes, we do break things, but it's to learn and to build resilience. The point is to do it in a very controlled manner so that you're not actually impacting your customer. Now, in a popular American drama series, Halt and Catch Fire, there's a quote there, and I'm, I'm borrowing that quote and, and really make it my own. Chaos engineering isn't the thing, but it is the thing that gets us to resilience. 
Now, our objective is not to create more chaos, but to use some controlled chaos to build resilience. So what's your objective? Your objective can be for higher availability, so add an extra nine to your service. Maybe to scale, support larger customer load. Or under failure conditions, you want a faster recovery. But it's important that you keep your eye on the prize. Be mission driven so that you know your objective before you really get into chaos engineering. Now, I'm going to call out why resilience matters and some, some motivations behind it. Downtimes are incredibly expensive. A couple of airlines, uh, Delta Airlines as well as British Airways, they both had some outage in the past. And each of this, those incidents cost the company over $100 million. For engineers, what you want to do is you want to innovate. You want to move fast. But how are you going to be able to move fast when you're always interrupted to do some of these reactive work? And for the on-call people, they get paged all the time. Right? There's so many pages going on, and they all the thing is, they all say they're important. So what happens is, when they're all important, people actually miss pages in the past because they're all important. Which one do you take care of? And there's the dreaded you know, 3 a.m. page that you have to wake up for. Nobody likes that. These are all the motivations behind why you want to build resiliency. Cool, you figure out your objective, and you want to start building resilience by running some game days. So let's get started. You come to this world of chaos engineering, you start your journey, you're at level one, you're that dude or dudette for the female in the room. You're eager to get started. The first problem you're going to face is, where do I begin? There's actually a lot of options. There's a lot of things you can do. Where do you go? Now, you're pumped and eager to take on the challenge, and you know that there's some really big monsters around uh, lurking in your system. This, this challenge is actually pretty immense. You're level one, and some of these monsters in there is over level 80. So they're big bosses. Thankfully, you should have some sense where these big monsters are lying in your system. The challenge to scale actually looks more like this, where you're the little guys in the middle, and you have these huge monsters that are around you. <clears throat> now, that still doesn't deter some people, especially <clears throat> management. They, they still want to, or, or potentially want you to, fight those big boss right away. And so what happens is the outcome, as you might have guessed, is that those big bosses take one swipe at you, and that's it. Oops. It's not fun. Um, and because it's not fun and you're just not getting anywhere, you stop playing the game. You stop right away. It's not what we want. And similarly, in the, in the chaos engineering world, right, people have really ambitious goal, and they want to dive right in. And the first thing they think about is, oh, let's do active, active. Let's do multi-region. Let's, you know, I'm going to throw in some crazy things in there. I'm going to throw in all the buzzwords. AI enabled. Let's uh, do some magic recovery system. Let's even throw blockchain in there and do some globally request tokens. I don't know. But really, what you want to be asking is, right now, today, this, this moment, if one of your critical systems or hosts go down, can you handle that? Do you know what's going to happen? So I'd say to start at your level, start easy and make progress from there. Start with something small, appropriate, and thoughtful. What, like what happens if you just take one critical host down and see what goes on? OK, you got it. Start small. Learn the basics. Let's move on. You're off on your journey. And you can start leveling on your own. Do you grind your way to level 99 by yourself? Or 
Why not make this journey a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable by having friends and having allies? So it's so much more fun, it's so much more effective when you have a team. You want a healer, you know, some mages or some tanks, right? Everybody brings something different to the table. They have different skills. It, it might sound cheesy, but you've heard this before where, uh, you know, whole is greater than the sum of its parts or that team acronym, together everyone achieves more. It's true. It's more fun. Now, for chaos party, by the way, party, you can take it in a pretty literal sense in that let's have a party, right? You can bring in foods, bring in drinks, have a theme, make it fun. Why not? Now, in terms of the people that are involved, you definitely want some executive alignment. You want some uh, senior members uh, to, uh, for oversight and alignment. You also want some experts. The experts are going to be able to come up with the experiments that ultimately ties back to the objectives that you have. Now, don't forget that you can also bring in the new hires and the interns because they often come with new perspectives and new ideas. And it's not just about engineering, too. Don't be afraid to loop in some of the other business units like sales, like marketing, uh, finance, because ask them what they care about and how, when you have systems go down, how does it affect their, uh, what they have to do and what they care about. So bring the people in so that you can gain more perspectives. Now, you definitely can play a lot of the games, you know, League of Legends, uh, Call of Duty, Overwatch, Fortnite. You can play all these games and be on your own and run around and do your own thing. But you're not really going to get that far, and it's not really going to be that fun. So you really want to find your companions, form your guild. It's just easier, and it's more fun. Great. You form your party. Now, where do you begin? What sort of environment should you run game days in? I don't always create chaos, but when I do, I do it in prod. Yeah. Well, test in prod, right? So Chaos Monkey actually pop popularized injecting chaos in production. Uh, for, the, for those of you who may not uh, have heard of Chaos Monkey, Chaos Monkey is Netflix open source tool that goes into their AWS environment and randomly terminates their <coughs> host. And they did it in production. Right? So Chaos Monkey is very popular. So a lot of people know of Chaos Engineering from Chaos Monkey. And so they think about running Chaos in prod. You're going to bound to have some people suggest to run everything in prod. I'd say no. Don't be that guy. I'm not necessarily saying don't ever do it in prod, but you have to be very thoughtful about it. Don't start or only do it in prod. There's a training ground and there's a battlefield. You don't have to go into the battlefield right away. You definitely want to go into the training grounds, test some of your tools, play around with it, right? Grab your weapons and test your aim, uh, learn about the tools, shoot some rounds to feel the recall so that you, you understand the tools. Now, the thing is though, do you always just stay in the training ground? You can be the absolute perfect you know, fighter, best in the world in the training grounds, right? You can have the perfect aim every time dead center in the training ground. So what, right? What good is it you can be the best fighter, but if you don't ever go to the battlefield. So if you remember, prod really is the only environment that matters. So the recommendation here would be to practice and to learn in your staging environment. But when you're ready, bring that experiment to prod for it to be real. So you know your objective, um, you got your party going, you started in staging, let's make a game day happen. Structure of a game day is typically three to five experiments, and for each of these experiments, you're injecting some failures. 
Uh, we call them attacks. So in order to run a game day, you're going to need some experiments. Now, how do you come up with these experiments? Fear not. We actually have one of these uh, experiment forms to help you, uh, guide you to design an experiment. But still, it's a bunch of boxes. You're likely going to be staring at the form. What else can we do to think about these experiments? Ask a couple questions. You can look forward as well as look backward. You look backward and ask the question, you know, what went wrong in the past? Look at the outages you've had. Don't tell me your, your system never goes down. We already addressed that in the beginning. So if you have outages in the past, you want to recreate them. You want to validate that you can now handle that same situation. Never fail the same way twice. And then you want to look forward. What could go wrong? Start thinking about some outages that could happen and try to get ahead of them. <clears throat> For each of these experiments, we, we take a fairly scientific approach and we like to work backwards from the situation. You want to start hypothesizing the outcome based on the failure scenario. And then you want to run some experiment. You want to scope it so that you start fairly small uh, so that you can minimize that blast radius. And then when you have results, you know, passing or failing, depending on uh, what happens, if they fail, you want to fix it. And then you want to repeat this and validate that you fixed it. And if it passed, you want to start dialing it up and run more experiments. There's a pretty important stage in this diagram to, to call out, and that's the abort condition. Remember earlier I mentioned about getting real in production? And the objective we have here is to learn and build resilience and not to actually cause customer pain. So <clears throat> when you're running in production, you definitely want to define these abort conditions so that if things actually go south, if you, there's actually bad surprises, you can stop that experiment at any point in time. Now I mentioned scoping and blast radius a couple of times. Let's dig into it a little bit more and what I mean by scoping these attacks. Depends on your attack. There's different vectors and different effects. So you want to think about it, right? Just as you know, that ice spear up top there, it's a straight line of sight. Um, that's one type of attack. And a different type of attack <laughs> is that circular attack below where you're affecting a certain area. So you really know, want to know what sort of attack you're, you're applying and what is going on um, in terms of creating these attacks. A more practical example uh, in, chaos in chaos engineering, for example, is to inject latency. In this chart, the vertical axis is about how much latency you want to inject to the environment. And the horizontal axis is about how many of the hosts or percentage of hosts you want to apply uh, this impact to. While it's obvious, I'm going to call it out anyway. Don't start on the upper right-hand corner. There's no good if you just throw a grenade launcher and blow everything up because you're not really going to learn that much. <clears throat> you want to start in the lower left-hand corner. Start small. Small, just inject a little bit of latency and uh, on a few hosts and see what happens. Now, eventually, you are wanting to dial up. You do want to go to that upper right-hand corner so that your systems can tolerate and withstand these greater system uh, failure conditions. So you definitely do want to dial up. But there's actually different ways to walk up to that upper right-hand corner. What do I mean by that is you can go up vertically. Right? And what this means is how large of an impact you're applying to those few hosts, you know, from 200 milliseconds to maybe one second. Or how you can also dial up horizontally. How widespread do you have this issue? Do you have it just on a few hosts and partial of your fleet? 
or your entire fleet. Now, there are other factors to consider as well. This is just a two vector, but there's actually multiple vectors, right? You can think about time duration, like right? how long that issue actually lasts. Is it something that's a jitter that's only a minute long? Or if it's something that's going to last 10, 30 minutes? But ultimately, the concept behind this is just to start small, start in that bottom left-hand corner, and then as you're ready, think about different ways to dial up. Great. Now we've talked about how you can scope an experiment. And even before you get any further, no doubt you'll have some smart people in the room that's going to say they ex know exactly what's going to happen. Do they? <coughs> Let's do an exercise. I do realize that we're in Germany, so this may be a sensitive topic, but uh, facts are facts, and it, it happened. So let's take a look at the, the World Cup this year. Uh, to the right are three matches that happened during the World Cup. So who do you think won the matches? Most would definitely expect Spain and Germany to win because they're the favorites. They're really good football teams. Now, these are the actual results of the, from those matches. Upsets could happen, and they do happen. So it's not always predictable. Now, knowing this, let me ask you again, though. Do you know which team will win if these matches were to be played again? I do want to say that perfects can happen, but they happen pretty rarely. In Street Fighter, for example, that one light punch, light jab, will ruin your perfect. Ah, it stinks. But what you have done is you've learned. Now you know better a little bit more about that spacing. So the key here is the more you play, the more you're learning. Now, so if someone tells you they know, are they 50% sure? Are they 80% sure? Or are they even 99% sure? But why guess? We can do even better. Let's be 100% sure. And that's by seeing what happened and by experiencing it. So find out, find out for yourself, right? Prove it to yourself and prove it to others that you know. Now, you have some scenarios mapped out. You can think about different failure scenarios, like hosts going offline, or services being slow, or just logs not rotating. So, and you map them to attack. So these are the things that you can inject to cause the failure. Um, you can terminate host. You can consume CPU. You can fill up disk. You can inject latency. Now that you have a list of attacks, the question you have then is, how do you easily create these attacks? So I really believe in using the right tool for the job. As you're not going to go use a hand grenade when your enemy is right in front of you, right? And you're not going to throw a knife when your enemy is really, really far away. That's just not going to work. So you want to grab your shotgun when your enemy's close and get a sniper rifle when your enemy is far away. So you really want to equip yourself with the tools that are available. There are a bunch of open source tools for chaos engineering to get you started, like Chaos Monkey. There are also some commercial tools that can help you get more done quicker, like Gremlin. You've designed your experiments, figured out some tooling, and you're about to run the experiment. Wait, what are you actually going to be looking at? So I'm going to talk a little bit about observability and what, can, what it can do for you. In many real-time strategy games, they have the concept of fog of war. And what that means is 
unless you have your own unit in that location, you actually can't see what's going on around there. Now, for those of you who've played these games before, you know that by looking at the map, that makes a world of difference. If you compare the two screenshots here, one, you only see that little corner, and the other, you see the entire map. It makes a big difference for the gamers. Because when you can see what the enemy is doing, you can counter against it. You can strategize when you know what's going on. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're just guessing in the dark. You have no idea what's going on. So observab observability allows you to gain clarity and then strategize accordingly. Some may say that this is a prerequisite to chaos engineering. And to some extent, it's true. It's a prerequisite to have monitoring uh, in order to start chaos engineering because it's, it's going to be more effective. But it's not a prerequisite to have perfect monitoring. A lot of people are hung up on that. They're hung up, oh, my monitoring's not good enough, so I can't do this. But something to think about is these chaos experiments actually can help you improve your monitoring. And there are plenty of observability products in the industry, so find one that works for you, and then you can get started. Now, after you run an experiment, how do you actually determine what's passing and what's failing? I, I briefly touched upon that earlier in the diagram of passing and failing, but what does that really mean? If you look at the form that we have there, there's actually two boxes there, hypothesis and results. Do they match? Are you able to handle that failure and it's matching and it's what you're expecting? If it is, great, you pass. You actually want to automate it and keep that uh, from, uh, from behaving differently. Now, if it fails, if it's not what you expected, then obviously the thing to do is to improve it, to fix it, and then to rerun this. The key here, though, is failing is OK, because you can lose a battle but still win the war. When you play these games, you probably lose some games, right? You're not going to be undefeated and win every single game. But when you lose your battle, do you stop playing? No, you don't. You keep playing. So the more you play, the more you're actually leveling up. Sometimes it will still feel like a grind. But what you don't realize it is that you're, you're actually maturing. Gradually from running manual attacks, let's schedule some of these attacks so that you can exercise them regularly. You're injecting chaos and, and adding it to your pipeline, right? In, injecting it, in, in, adding it to your uh, CI CD pipeline so that this acts as more of a regression testing for resilience. <coughs> Get on the battlefield, right? When you have it buttoned up in staging, let's run some of these small experiments in prod. Or go and experiment something new. There's always something new that you can experiment on. Game day is also not a one and done event. That's a, a big problem with a lot of today's DR plans, business continuous, continuity plans. They do it once, they check the checkbox, and it's done. That's not effective because over the year, things change. So you definitely need to regularly exercise. So you want to plan for that next game day, and don't be complacent because you're done with one game day. Always, there's always new, new issues that can surface. Remember those objectives that you had earlier in the talk? They're not going to be achieved tomorrow. You actually have to track and measure over time. So you definitely want to run these game days regularly. Practice, practice, practice. Results may not show tomorrow, but if you keep practicing, I guarantee that you'll get better over time. 
Now, enterprise companies often have mixed environments. Some are doing bare metal servers, some on VMs, and maybe in the cloud, right? And some work on the really bleeding edge technologies and they do serverless compute. Excellent. Someone might say, I do serverless, I don't need chaos. Now this is what the user sees. They just see delays or errors. They're not gonna know or care about whether you run on serverless or serverful, right? It's the user experience that matters. And if you think serverless cannot fail, you really should think again. Serverless indeed help you take care of some infrastructure related failures. Well, realistically, someone else is taking care of that. But there's still much more in the stack that can fail. Applications are quite complicated today, these days. You look at an application, they're really consisted of some sort of edge, right? DNS, some CDN, you have some front end, load balancers, some API servers, and then you have some back end, some data stores, right? Whether it's a, a, a Elasticsearch or MySQL or Dynamo, or you have Kafka data streams, and obviously there's all sorts of infrastructure stuff that, that goes along with it, right? You can run Kubernetes, you can run containers, there's a physical server, there's data center, and all of these things can go wrong. So you actually should be chaosing all of them so that you can build confidence. Now, outside of tech, don't forget the human too. Chaos engineering is actually really good for training. If you think about fire drills, we practice fire drill really to exercise the human. But fire drill is not, of course, to burn down the building. You're not trying to burn down the building. Same thing, chaos engineering, you're not trying to actually create chaos. But you can train the human. So you can dust off your run books and actually practice them with chaos engineering. Now, um, I also like to take this opportunity to share some of the game day's findings that I've had with some of the customers I've worked with. This is a fairly straightforward architecture, right? You have some front end talking some back end, <coughs> and the back end uses DynamoDB as their data store. And they're asking basically what happens if the connection to the database is gone. The expectation is that it errors out, you have an internal error, so 500 gets returned to the front end. What happens when they actually exercise this is that instead of a 500, they actually got a 404 back. Whoops. We all know that a lot of people, a lot of you potentially, put some really cool 404 graphic, right, and put some really fun 404 page. But this is actually not the right time to show it. So you're really just lying to your users if you think it's a 404 instead of 500. That's something they learn. This is another scenario. Very often, people actually hand you a legacy app to maintain. First of all, having some sort of diagram that goes with your legacy app is amazing because most people don't even get that, right? Now, in the, if you get a diagram, if you're lucky enough to get a diagram, what you may see is a simple arrow that's telling you that there's interaction between your web server or app server to the database. Now, they are injecting some latency um, you know, between the app server and the database, so the expectation is whatever they inject, um, the user gets a similar amount of delay. But, what they find out is, if you think about that connection, that simple arrow between the two uh, components, there's actually reads and writes, and there's actually multiple reads and some writes. So when you're injecting a latency to that connection, 
what happens is that there's a magnification, there's amplification, because you're actually making multiple calls, and each call is having that extra latency. So this helps them better understand the interactions between the app server and the database server. And so ultimately, it will help them effectively deal with their uh, retries and their timeout and tune them better. <coughs> this next scenario is about monitoring. Right? I can see this. I can't see that. So what they're testing is they own this consumer app, a Q consumer application, right? Basically, uh, they, their applications grab a message from Kafka. They're using Kafka as a message queue. So they grab the message from Kafka. And uh, they require some database uh, information to process the, the message. And so they're asking what happens if that connection to the database is gone. So it's, it's what they're expecting, where when they disconnect it from the database, the, they see that the apps can no longer message to, uh, process the message, so the message gets placed back in the queue. They don't lose any message. Great. But what they realize is that even though they, they can see that they're not being able to process message, they can't see, they don't have visibility over how Kafka is doing. You definitely, in this scenario, have some back pressure and that you have that queue that is growing and backed up. So when you don't have visibility on how fast Kafka, uh, the queue is growing, you can run out of this space and other bad things can happen. So what they realize is from a monitoring perspective, they actually don't have enough uh, visibility into their Kafka cluster. Now this one is just, uh, they're just getting into running containers, dockerizing their, their services, and going to microservices. And uh, typically, when you do microservices, you want some sort of decoupling or loose coupling, right? Um, the experiment is to, they're actually working on an orchestrator, so basically the experiment is to kill a container and see whether the orchestrator can spin it back up. They brought down the container, um, and, of course, you then type in Docker PS and see what's going on. Um, that container came back up. The uptime checks out, right? It's a few seconds in. But then they notice there's a couple of adjacent container that also has this uptime of just a couple of seconds. So what happened there? So they tried it again, right? They tried to kill again. Let's repeat this. So it's repeatable. It should be repeatable. They repeat it. Um, they kill that same container. And they notice that when they kill that container, the other couple of adjacent containers also went down and came back up. So the good thing is the orchestrator is doing what it's doing. If it dies, it comes back up. But then what they find out is that they're not really decoupled. There's still some sort of coupling going on between that container and a couple of other ones that got brought down with it. So then they have to further investigate and see what's going on with that coupling. Now, if you're thoughtful about how you practice chaos engineering, it's not that scary. It's actually a lot like playing video games. It's fun. So I challenge you to run an experiment to fail something in your environment, of course, to do it in a safe and controlled manner, and then tell us what you've learned. Once you start, I bet you can't stop playing. So pick up that controller and game on. Thank you. <laughs>